Did a suspect in a Canadian beach lane carry out congeries of double murders for the next three decades in the Pacific Northwest? There may be compulsory reasons as to why this may be true. We begin this search for answers by starting with the first suspected slayings, which occurred in 1972. A family picks up their roots and flees from their violent country only to encounter a nightmare worse than anything they ever imagined. Jeffrey Durant was an inspiring professor in South Africa when he married his wife, Barbara. She was an English born emigre who trained as a nurse. She helped provide health care for poor black families. In 1955, Barbara joined the nonviolent Black Sash movement, opposing past laws and other racist legis legislation. She broadcast on Radio Freedom, a pirate station which aired the state of press news. Mr. Durant was head of the English department at the University of Natal. He was immersed in opposition of the country's racist practices against black people, which included segregation. He wrote news bulletins and pamphlets. As time went on, many of the Durant's friends were arrested. It was a dangerous time, yet the Durant started a family. In 1943, they had a son and named him John. They had two girls behind him. Catherine in 1950 and Anne in 1952. The years passed by and when their son, near the age when he would be drafted into the South African military, the Durants decided to start a new and peaceful Canada. They did not want their son to have to enforce laws that they didn't believe in. So Mr. Durant began a new life in Canada with his family and became the head of the English department at the University of Manitoba. He went on to take the same position at the University of British Columbia. He was a well-written author. He wrote two comprehensive studies of the poetry of William Wordsworth, one of which was reissued in 2009 as a digital edition on the 30th anniversary of its original publication by Cambridge University Press. He was invited to annual summer expeditions by the Harry Hawthorne Foundation for the inculcation and propagation of the principles and ethics of fly fishing. This is a group formed by professors during a trip to Vancouver Island. Growing up under this influence, his youngest daughter, Anne, wanted to leave her mark on the world as well. She was strong-willed and determined she graduated from high school and enrolled in the university's Arts One program, an integrated humanities program said to foster critical thinking. Professor Durant believed the wide chasm grew between Anne and her family after she became influenced by a teacher. He stated that she was influenced by an instructor in Arts One into taking up the hippie lifestyle. Back then, some believed the hippies were dirty drug addicts, that sort. A lot of people came to that conclusion because of Charles Manson and his unkempt appearance. Professor Durant didn't want that lifestyle for his daughter, but she wouldn't listen to him. She and a friend, a foreign exchange student from Sweden named Leif, Leif Carlson, joined hundreds of other hippies and lived in a makeshift lean-to along the beautiful coast of Vancouver Island. She was so close, yet at the same time, so far away from her family, she and her father became estranged. It hurt Professor Durant, but he could not control his daughter's life. They eventually reconciled, which was a blessing because no one could have foreseen what would happen to his precious baby girl in the summer of 1972. It was wonderful that they had their moment before tragedy struck their lives. Each summer, the west coast of Vancouver Island was swamped by thousands of people. The hippie lifestyle was huge back then. The beach was covered in shacks, tents, and lean-tos. The island was a quiet village of fishing families and loggers that had been taken over by campers who were heavy into drugs and shoplifting. Thumbing a ride was a way of life. Enter Joseph Henry Burgess. 
He arrived to the island in May of 1972. The tall, skinny, bearded 25-year-old had fled to Canada from New Jersey in 1968 after failing to report for induction into the Army. He kept to Canada's Easter cities and held down odd jobs for a few years. He bounced a few checks. He trained as a bush pilot. He did drugs. As he ventured out west, he purchased a Javon rifle, a 22 caliber semi-automatic that could be fitted with a 20 round clip and broken down to carry in a duffel bag. He later would brag about his marksmanship. Burgess was born to a prominent Catholic family in Jersey City. He attended a Jesuit college and taught Bible classes. Something changed in him, and by the time he reached Vancouver Island, he had went off the deep end. He became a Jesus freak, as one of his acquaintances put it to the police. According to a police summary, witnesses that had contact with Burgess at the time stated that he would quote the Bible and speak of the wrath of God, always ending his conversation with, Amen. Earlier, Burgess, who had assumed the surname of Burke, now went by the name of Job Weeks, or just Job, from the Old Testament in the Bible. Job was a man whose faith was tested in a manner in which would fail most men. Burgess likened himself to him. Burgess moved into a small one-house Children of God commune in Port Alberni. This barely lasted a week. His rifle made his housemates nervous. He bought some ammo and moved to Radar Beach, a few miles south of Tofino. When he left the commune, he vowed to live as a hermit until he heard from the Lord. Police reports say that during his week on the beach, he was seen with outdoor survival manuals. He was spotted by a stream, attempted to teach others how to pray, and he was seen cleaning his rifle. In the midst of all this, Burgess found time to make an awkward pass at a sunbathing woman. He was quoting verses from the book of Job while sizing her up. He complained to the woman about a newly arrived couple who were young, Christian, and unwed. They'd set up camp together near the communal water hole in the woods just a short walk from the beach. The woman told investigators he did not approve of their being together. About two days after this exchange, the bodies of Ann Barbara Durant, who just celebrated her 20th birthday, and Leif Bertil Carlson, a 19-year-old Swedish foreign exchange student, were found in their camp by the water hole. The two young adults were wearing t-shirts and nestled together under a single sleeping bag. They appeared to have been sleeping when struck at close range by rounds from a 22 caliber rifle, later determined to be a Javarm. Anne had been hit five times, four shots to the head and one that passed through her hand and hip. Carlson was shot four times, all in the head. Their IDs were ripped up and found on their bodies. By the time Durant and Carlson were found, Burgess was gone. He'd made a hasty getaway, leaving behind a Canadian health card, biblical verses on scraps of paper, and a rifle cleaning kit. The police found his fingerprints on their IDs. On the trail leading away from the beach, Mounties also discovered a snapshot of Burgess flashing a peace sign that was torn into pieces, a guitar, prescription glasses, a roach clip, a shoe, a bag of clothes, and a Bible. Inscribed in the Bible was the name Job Weeks. Investigators first thought that Burgess had killed himself, but his body and rifle were never found. Despite a high profile manhunt and an international arrest warrant, he was never caught. The case became cold. It came to be remembered by locals, if at all, as one more piece of strange lore from a strange time. Was Joseph Burgess the murderer? If so, did he continue to kill after this? In 1977, the bodies of two teenagers were found in east of Eugene, Oregon at a U.S. Forest Service picnic ground shot to death. 
Leanna Gay Adank, 16, and Eric Sean Goldstrand, 17, had left their school, North Eugene High School, Thursday afternoon for a senior gathering at Broken Bowl Picnic Grounds near Fall Creek Reservoir. They decided to stay after the picnic and do some fishing. When the couple did not return home Thursday night, the authorities were alerted. Sheriff's deputies found Leanna's new body in a clearing at the Broken Bowl Picnic Grounds. Eric's body was later found in a brushy area about 25 feet away. Leanna had been sexually assaulted. With just days until graduation, the news was devastating to their community. Both students were described as good looking and popular. Eric's stepfather said that for several years, they thought they had a good suspect, but DNA ultimately excluded him. As far as Eric's murder being possibly tied to other murders in the Northwest, it is completely possible. The reason that he said this is that the nature of the murders, the completely cold-blooded way that they were committed, and the time that obviously had to have been spent committing the murders will point toward a serial type killer. Experts say that indeed, it is rare for a person to randomly kill victims without having done it before or without ever doing it again. It appears that all indications of the murders of Leanna and Eric were random. It was assumed that they were happened upon, considering that a fishing pole and other items were beside the picnic table in the spot that they were in. Fast forward to June of 1988. A couple visiting Mount Shasta, California were reported missing by family members. Jerry Middleton and Pamela had recently acquired a pickup truck and it was believed that they had been in an accident at first. The Siskiyou County Sheriff's De Department began a massive search but could find no trace of the newlyweds. Six months later, law enforcement officials discovered Jerry and Pamela in a remote area near Lake of the Woods, about 80 miles out and across the state line in Oregon. Naked and in the bed of their truck, they were embracing. They'd both been shot through the mouth and their hands were found to be on a 25 caliber pistol. The Klamath County Sheriff's Department rules the deaths a double homicide, I mean suicide, but their families adamantly rejected the suicide theory, insisted the couple had recently wed and were both very happy. Despite the family's protest, Klamath County closed the case. Two months later, another couple was found shot to death in a campground. Douglas Anderson, 26, and his wife, Rosina, 31. They were discovered in their van parked near Mill Creek inside Jedediah Smith Redwood Woods State Park, about five miles south of Crescent City, California. A source from the local sheriff's department is quoted as saying they never established a motive for the murders. The case is still open. On October 18, 2003, Lisa Guerrero, 19, and Brandon Rumball, 20, were found in the back of their pickup truck, still lying in their sleeping bags by their friends. They had been shot several times in the head. The plan had been to return to the spot of their first date, a desert camping area near Bumblebee, Arizona, one hour north of Scottsdale. They wanted to park the pickup truck they borrowed from Lisa's mom for the night, unfold sleeping bag in the truck's bed, and reminisce about their romance on their first year anniversary. The couple had met the year before in a club in Scottsdale. What was supposed to be a romantic night of stargazing and camping near Sunset Point turned into a nightmare. Lisa told her uncle Mike, who helped raise her after her father died of cancer, not to tell her mother, Paula, where she was going that night because she knew her mother would worry. When they didn't return on Sunday, which was the day they planned to come home, friends and family went looking for them. Friends found the 2000 F-150 parked in a dirt parking area off Bumblebee Road, a short distance from Interstate 17. Much to their horror, the couple was found lying dead inside sleeping bags in the truck's bed each with multiple gunshot wounds to the head. The gun that was used was a 25 caliber hunting gun. Lisa worked at Salt River Project and was a member of her church band. 
Brandon was a student at Arizona State University and worked as a fitness trainer. Detectives found a disposable camera with a batch of solo shots of Lisa and Brandon sitting in the bed of the truck before they were murdered. Before those photos, there are blurry pictures of a compact fluorescent light CFL in a building, but detectives can't determine where those pictures were taken or where the couple was before they parked for the night. Lisa and Brandon also had a video camera with them, but detectives never found it. They found the camera case and knew the serial number, but the whereabouts of the camera is unknown. Authorities believe it was a random act. In 2005, Stephen Hogan, 54, and Jeanette Bauman, 56, were found off a rural spur road in Willamette National Forest, south of Oak Ridge, Oregon. They had been shot to death along with their dog, Caesar. Police believe that whoever shot the couple also took Stephen's license plates and possibly some of his fishing items. The police don't have a motive. Stephen and Jeanette were described as wonderful people with no known enemies. In 2006, a school librarian and her daughter, an environmentalist and soon-to-be teacher, took a hike in the Baker Snoqualmie National Forest about an hour north, northeast of Seattle. Mary, 56, and Susanna Stodden, 27, were last seen around 10 a.m. as they prepared to hike the Pinnacle Lake Trail. Four and a half hours later, some other hikers found the mother and daughter dead from gunshot wounds. Initially, Mary's husband was the suspect in his wife and daughter's murders. He took two inconclusive polygraph tests. Authorities eventually stopped looking at him and focused on finding the real killer. Could all of these murders have been committed by the same person, or are they separate incidents? The world may never know who was the perpetrator in all of these specific Northwest killings, because in 2009, Joseph Burgess died in a shootout with sheriff deputies. His death did not come without more perplexity. The 357 revolver he used to kill Sheriff Sergeant Joe Harris belonged to a man reported missing in 2007 by the name of David Ely. David Ely was reported missing by his family in the Hay Maze Mountains and has never been seen again. Two deputies were investigating a series of break-ins into vacation homes and were hiding out in a cabin when suddenly Burgess entered through an unlocked window. He got into a scuffle with the deputies. They overpowered him and put him in handcuffs. In the fracas, he managed to reach a revolver that was tucked in his waistband behind his back. He started shooting, striking Sergeant Joe Harris, who retrieved his own weapon and fired back. Both men died. We are left to wonder, was Burgess a serial killer? If he was involved in these homicides, he left several families with many unanswered questions, sorrow, and misery in the wake of his crimes. Hopefully one day the authorities will be able to ascertain the truth and the families of the victims will find peace. If you know anything about these cases, please